This week, the Battle of the Bonds reaches its thrilling conclusion in the shape of Never Say Never Again. Was it really gonna... that thrilling? <laughs> it was. It ended in waves of liniment and... and Rowan Atkinson... Well, at, le- at least we haven't seen the story before. Um... It's completely new. <laughs> it, is, it is completely new, and I will explain why in a moment. This is not a remake of Thunderball, okay? <laughs> Never. Our lawyers have instructed us to say... <laughs> Kevin McClory forces us from beyond the grave to say. Anyway, if you didn't know, this movie stars Sean Connery, Kim Basinger, Who's he? Tower. <laughs> what? <laughs> Basinger! He was asking who Sean Connery is. Yeah, exactly. Which he's, la- he's learnt to pronounce since the Thunderball episode. Seen Canary. <laughs> Seen Can- <laughs> Seen Canaries, yeah. From Stony Bridge. Anyway. Other names that I can't pronounce are... Max von Sydow, Edward Fox, amazingly. Edward ben Fox, <laughs> amazingly, is that a double barrelled name? A double barrelled name. Or did he marry Mister Amazingly and he just put them together? I just think it's amazing that he's in this movie. I just it's, uh, yeah, that's the only thing amazing about it. It's a real low point for him. Um, anyway, also starring Bernie Casey and Barbara Carrera, based on an original story by Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and Ian Fleming, directed by Irvin Kershner. And released in 1983. What do we make of it then, guys? After you, Chris. <laughs> okay. Um, well, despite what I, uh, I just said, I, I'd still kind of like Never Say Never Again. Um, it's Connery returning after Diamonds, and uh, this this time round, he looks like he's actually enjoying himself. It looks like he's he's coming back to kind of like rekindle some of the fire you once had. Uh it's I think it's like a reminiscence for Connery. Um I think I think the film kinda of works better uh with uh, the plot fundable at certain parts. Uh, I like the villain and uh I I like some of the elements, I like the fact that it's an aging bond and I like the kind of the little, the little, the little winks to the camera. Um it has Max von Sch- um Schnow- is, it, is it Snowden? Schnowden? Cedar. Cedar, yeah. Cedar. Cedar. Um, I, I always, yeah, I always say Snow. Uh, yeah, that's me. Typical English Brit murdering. Starring Edward Snowden. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> Seen Canaries? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, are you. Did that, that off the IT crowd? No. I don't. Uh, that, that, that bit always makes me laugh whenever he's like, he's in court and he goes, Sing Canary! <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't remember that movie. Oh yeah, it, uh, Matt Barry, legend. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, uh, Max uh, Max von Sheldon. Uh, well, Max. <laughs> Sheldon, Max von Sheldon. <laughs> At least I'm not the only one who can't pronounce it. So <laughs> Max, <laughs> Max von Schnickenspiel. I don't know. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I, I, I like his turn. I like, well, I like him as Blofeld, but I just don't. I just don't. They don't think they did enough with it. He just basically like sit in a chair, struck a cat for ten seconds. Um, so did Smith, wasn't it? Because it wasn't it him. Hmm? That's what he does anyway. Yes, but I just like. I would have liked a bit more scenery chewing because I think it, it could have been like a potential best casting for Blofeld, but. Um, but there you are. But I, I do like the villain. I like the uh, the hench lady in this as well, um, which is oddly because we were big fans of the uh, counterpart in Thunderball. So uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I generally quite enjoy it. It's it's a bit of a, an odd odd one. Um, if you if this came out at the time, I probably would have been dead set against it, going like, why? What's the point? What's the point of doing this again? But after going back to it and kind of growing up watching it um i kind of glad it exists as a kind of like an odd little side note for bond really uh what do you think dave i think as long as you can forget uh if you're not expecting sort of 1962 to 1965 connery you can have a really good time with this and i think that i i've had problems with it over the years i think for just that reason it's like the main man in the official series is by this point too old and then Con- they bring back connery who's too old as well but watching it again in preparation for this he is really good in this it's one of his better performances in the role he manages to be sort of swar- swaggering but not arrogant at the same time which is kind of it's a really interesting performance i think with regard to the film as a whole it, 
it's kind of a, at once better and worse than it's got any right to be. I say better because as we talk through the film, the production history on this is a mess. The writing history on this is a mess. So to have anything at all cohesive on the screen with such a good lead performance is actually a bit of a minor miracle. But it's worse than it should be because Kevin McClory's been thinking about this since the mid-60s. He had 10 years to think about what his rights were in terms of adapting the, the original work, and we'll come on to what that means in a minute. And the 10 years was up actually at the beginning of 1976. So he's had at least seven years to assemble a script that satisfies everybody, satisfies the lawyers, satisfies the stars, and get a deal in place. And yet we hear stories of absolute chaos on the script front. And it does show in the final film. There are things that are sort of not properly explained, things that don't quite make sense. And you've got... um, you've got sort of things that are sort of set up and never really go anywhere. And it actually reminds me in places, although it's much better than Casino Royale 1967, because the biggest problem with that film was five different directors, Peter Sellers walking off set, different writers, and you've got things picked up and dropped. And whilst this is a lot more cohesive, that it does wear the scars of its production history, but it's better than Octopussy, in my opinion. And although it isn't a Bond film per se, and, and that does affect it, the lack of Eon touches, for all but about, the for the first three quarters, I think this is actually really quite solid. Becca, what do you think? Um, Dave mentioned this, um, the script. Um, I did a bit of reading and mentioned that there was script um, input from Dick Clement and Ian Lefrenet, which I think is so random. So you've got like, the writers of like Porridge... Um, I'll be the same pet and sort of classic British sitcoms working on a non Eon Bond movie are so weird. What do you think to that? Um, I, I, <laughs> there were at least 10 different writers on this at one time or another. The, the credited writer is Lorenzo Semple Jr., who's done a lot of different stuff, but the thing that always stands out to me, I mean, he did Papillon, but he also did the Batman television series from the 60s. <laughs> we'll forget um, about Ian Lafrenny and... Sorry, I've said them. What was the other guy's name? Sorry, oh, sorry, Dick Clement. Dick Clement, yeah. They are interviewed on the special features, and they basically say that about the first 40 minutes is theirs. And oh. you can kind of see that because, well, actually, the, the, uh, I, need to, I need a sample, Mr. Bond. What, from here? That's a <laughs> joke that comes directly from Ronnie Barker's mouth in porridge. So you can see it in some of the humour in in the first section but all sorts of different people wrote on this uh actually they looked for input because this film was produced by jack swartzman jack swartzman was married to talia shire talia shire you'd know from as adrian balboa from the rocky films and uh connie corleone from the godfather films but she was the she is and still remains the sister of francis ford coppola and francis ford coppola did did a pass at this script as well so it had the world and its wife on it it really did the fact you got a couple of comedy writers seems a bit odd but actually they're, they're responsible for some of the better bits of the film yeah i think it's probably just added into like can you just throw in some like a few like ad libs of connery to say kind of thing well yeah you might say that but actually um one of the things they talk about on the special features is they had no, well they had a start to the film to cut a long story short that pre well, yeah, I suppose it was supposed to be a pre title at the time. I think they thought that they were going to do some spin on the sort of bond openings we're used to um but the the pre title they came up with doesn't show Connery's face till the very end, and it's like you've got your big draw is you've got the real James Bond effectively, and you're going to cover his face, so they wrote the um action sequence you get at the start. But they wrote it as a ticking clock, effectively. And they said it was one of the worst post-production decisions ever to put a really sappy song over it. But, they, yeah, they didn't just write jokes. They wrote things that, that fundamentally shaped this film. But as we go through it, you're going to see them go to locations that don't... You think, what did they go there for? And and as we talk through it, they didn't know what they were doing from scene to scene. A lot of what a Fatima Blush does is very random. And it's because they they flashed they fleshed her character out as they went along, so it it is a mess. Um, 
but they've put a reasonably cohesive story on the screen, if only because they had a book to go off. I mean, if they'd had no book to go off, God only knows what this would have been. Now, that's my kind of main problem with this film. I mean, it's enjoyable as it is. Mm. It is a complete mess. Um, let's say that the scenes towards the end of the film, literally they look as if they've just been written on the fly and said, oh, here you go, here's your lines for the day, let's shoot it. Um, the, the ending's terrible. It's, it's, it's a complete mess. Mm. I mean, just like all the... I mean, Sean Connery's great. He, he, you know, despite the production problems, it's clear he's having the most fun he's had in a Bond movie since From Russia With Love, I guess. Um, he's, he's looking very tanned and leathery, so he's had, clearly been having a good time in the Bahamas. Mm. But, um, yeah, I just think yeah. in scripts and strategy well, as well, it's just yeah. a complete mess. But it's a, it's a good laugh. I had fun watching it. And even though I don't count it as a real Bond movie, it doesn't quite fall outside the rankings for me. Um, but, no, it's an enjoyable watch anyway. And, you know, a good sort of curio, I guess, for Bond fans. Well, I guess we best actually start before we go into sort of talking through the film sequentially. It's never quite where you've got sort of story and background to tell on one of these films. It's very difficult to know where to drop it in, you know. But I think in this case, there was such a build up to it. And really, this is part two of three, because the rest of this story will tell in the lead up to Casino Royale, because this has a direct impact on Eon Productions getting Casino Royale and making that film. But we've got that little bit sort of after Thunderball. It goes quiet for a few years. Uh, Kevin McClory has signed up to his 10 years. Those 10 years are up in early, uh, yeah, early 1976, January, February time. And immediately he announces he wants to do James Bond of the Secret Service. Now, you'll have heard another title for this, the fi- what the film was going to be at this point, And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, at the same time, he goes to Eon Productions and says um, that he threatens, he starts saying that he owns Blofeld. He owns Blofeld and he owns Spectre. So Cubby Broccoli says to Christopher Wood, Rob Spectre or Blofeld out of this. And they did it before it went to court, but assuredly it would have. At the same time, they turned around having heard on a James Bond of the Secret Service, Eon Productions, and said, that's too close to Honor Majesty's Secret Service. So they cut that back. He tended to like one-word titles anyway, so it was renamed Warhead. And on board, he managed to get Len Dayton, the celebrated author, and he got Sean Connery on board as effectively a consultant to it. He was going to produce and script the long-term game, knowing what a chance a Kevin McClory could be, <laughs> was almost certainly to get Connery to play the role, but that wasn't the deal to begin with. Paramount Pictures gets involved, and so now you have got a new Bond film coming by from Paramount Pictures called Warhead, uh, scripted by Len Dayton with Sean Connery, and um, with a very expensive uh, finale at the Statue of Liberty. Now, the un, the sort of word on this script was it's dazzling. Now, whether that's just the passage of time, I don't know. But apparently that was a very special script. But then it sort of went into litigation because Eon Production said that's not in the book. Yeah, the, the finish at the um, Statue of Liberty, several elements of it, they were arguing that he, ho- he only had the right to adapt the book, not even to remake Thunderball, not the liberties that was taken there, but to adapt the book. Paramount got cold feet and pulled out, and we are left at the end of the 70s with nothing. Fast forward a couple of years, Sean Connery had pulled out because he didn't he wanted to be he didn't want any part of the litigation. But as I say, Paramount weren't convinced that they had a, a case really. They didn't want any part of it. Uh but things turned around when Jack Schwartzman got involved. Jack Schwartzman was an entertainment lawyer, uh not much of a producing past, particularly. Um and he agreed to sort of get involved and fund it and everything else. Sean Connery agreed to get involved on the on the proviso that uh, he would be indemnified against any damages, and he would also have uh, pre- uh, director, script, and cast approval. So he would have full say on everything that was going to happen. So this was in many ways a Sean Connery picture. And to cut a long story short, they pitched up at Orion, and that's where the film was made. Um Director choice, uh, even down to, um, we'll get on to score, but the, the Michel Legrand, who did the score. Um, Jack Schwartzman wanted James Horner, who was just coming off the Wrath of Khan. Um, Sean Connery bumped into Michel Legrand in a, 
in a hallway somewhere and they got talking and he scores the film. We'll get onto the specific production as we go through the actual film itself, because you can point to specific scenes and sequences and bits of the script. But that's how we end up with Never Say Never Again. They rush the film through. Eon in, tried to injunct at the last minute, but the film's already made. And the court's attitude is, why are you trying to injunct now? You've, the money's been spent. Um, and that's how we end up with Never Say Never Again in 1983. So basically, the Kevin McCoy had a, a much, well, I'll say a bigger script with big, grander ideas, but the money for he had for it just got chewed up in the lawsuits. It's not, and... it's not so much money, it's more the fact that, and we'll see this as we get into Never Say Never Again, because this film right. is heavily, heavily hamstrung by the whole legal process during it. I'm not even talking about money being chewed up. This had a bigger budget than Octopussy, significantly bigger budget than Octopussy. What it is, is... Eon would go to would say that's not in the book, and Kevin McClory was desperately trying to get hold of like the papers from the the original case, because if there was any evidence that Jack Whittingham had sat down and written a set piece that say had taken place in Egypt, but they ended up new using it, that would be fair game because it was part of that project. Um, but yeah, he ended up having to. They even used to. They even got to the point they were arguing over dialogue. Because they were saying, well, the dialogue's got to be what's in the book. Well, you can't write a book's di- a, a film's dialogue from a book. So, yeah, the reason the Warhead script, which I be- I've, I've heard is good, um, was scrapped was it wasn't close enough to Thunderball and Paramount got cold feet. And once a major studio and the star gets cold feet, you've got to go back to square one, really. Yeah, it's like I Death Note, really. I'm kind of interested to, to read if, you know, if it's online, that Warhead script. I honestly don't know if it is. Uh, I didn't go looking for it. What I read, in, I, I watched all the special features in preparation for this. I also read the Battle for Bond, or the relevant bits. I read from, basically, I read from um, McClory coming back on the scene in sort of late '75, right the way through to the end of the story, um, and I read that a couple of times. So, yeah, it, it, I don't know whether the Warhead script exists now. I really don't, but. There was a lot of excitement in Hollywood at the time that it was one of the best un- unproduced scripts around, but it wasn't cl- it wasn't close enough to the. the That'd be really interesting if, if it is kind of floating around out there. It'd be interesting to kind of have a look at it and mm. you know, see what changes. Were, obviously, we know what changes were made, but yeah. have a good look at it from a production point of view. That'd be fascinating. It would. But I will say this for Kevin McCloy: Why? I mean, like, I just don't get the, his reasoning for getting obsessed. For it's like, no, I must. We, do bond it's like well no it was even fleming's creation why why are you obsessed it's mm. like well i have to make that that film that mm. i that that I, that I scripted well you did it was thunderball remember you know yeah. it, it got made you <laughs> he's know, obsessed with it you, you were part of the production you know and you know he had balls big enough well, i think this was jack Schwartzman, not kevin mcclory but they even went to eon and offered them this as a co-production you yeah, know, he know. Eon are, are doing perfectly fine forget what i did or didn't think about octopussy the, the films are doing okay the films are doing okay. They're popular enough. Eon do not need this. I think maybe by Thunderball he kind of felt a bit slighted, perhaps. But yeah, because it is so random. Because one man was obsessed obsessed by one film for so long. I mean, it cost him quite badly in terms of his health for Kevin McClory. Well, he was an alcoholic as well, which didn't. Well, exactly. Yeah, that and a number of contrib- contributing factors. Yeah. But it's just like, yeah, he was obsessed for, for so long, and just like, let it lie, you know. What doesn't make sense to me about his whole approach to Bond, and we see it again. I mean, I, I don't want to tell too much of the story post this film because we'll talk about it in the lead-up to Casino Royale, and that's in some ways the more interesting part. But you know, we all know that later in later in the timeline, he was talking about doing more with Timothy Dalton, you know, and so on. Before Sean Connery pitched into this, there was talk of Lazenby. He always kind of wanted to take like the, a previous Bond, and yet he argued he had the momentum and the right to make a series. He genuinely thought, and at times the law kind of supported him on this, that he could kind of make sequels to this. Well, if that's the case, why do you cast Sean Connery first time out? I kind of wonder if, if he had cast one of the Eon candidates um, for this, like a Lewis Collins or something, might he have created a new momentum, made the official series look a bit old hat, and maybe he'd have had more momentum, but he didn't. He kind of just redid something they'd already seen with a guy who was only ever going to make one. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. 
I mean, so basically, his momentum was like, let's create like something. Let's base something on what I've already done, and make and, and make something new enough that it can spin off from that to be its own thing. Is that basically what they were going for? Again, anything that was part of the whole Longitude seventy eight West process and the effect of the book afterwards. He thought he could make a series with Spectre and Blofeld and so on. Well, without further ado, let's uh, do what we always do and uh, <laughs> uh, run through the film by memory. So, <laughs> Becca. This is why I make notes, because otherwise... Because we I've can't seen it like asked. three times now. You make notes because we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, you, make, like... you make notes because we don't, we, we don't have to, that's why. Yeah. That's it, because my memory is so crap. I've got I've got a very poor short term memory, um, yeah, because I'm special. Um, but yeah, we see him on the training mission, don't we? And it's probably this like is a bizarre training work. mission. There's, there's some, but only we, we find out later on that it's actually it's a test. Who's in on this though? Because I mean, he's he's garroting people and appears to break a few necks and stuff, and properly knocks some people. It doesn't he actually throw someone off a roof. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah, it does. It's well, just yeah, like, it's a well done, <laughs> They put a song over it, and that song's a horrible earworm. And I've seen this more than once in the last few weeks. So you've been thinking, never seen never <laughs> oh, again. It's, it's like it's, it's, it's when you when you open up your action film with an action scene. The, what what you want is music that is like shitty jazz done on a Casio keyboard that you find. <laughs> In a in a in a in a in a cafe lounge cafe somewhere, you know, it's that's it's that's, that's the keyboard. sound you want, isn't it? It's awful. This song. It's so ridiculously eighties as well. It's, and the first the first few notes sound like a warped VHS. <laughs> yeah, literally. I don't have the Blu-ray, but I was looking on the DVD, and it's like, and think, oh god, you know, the head on my DVD player is you know clean. I was like, what's going on? What is this tat? Yeah. They, they, uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. This song was meant was offered to um, Bonnie Tyler. Oh God! It's and she and she wants she wanted to do the Bond thing, a Bond thing. You know, whether you think this is a real Bond film or not, she was up for the idea. And then she heard the song. Yeah, I don't blame her. And so I it's not I, really her sound, though, is it, Bonnie Tyler? It's, you know, no, it's, you know, it's not. But no. yeah, she didn't like the song. The song wasn't. The song is not good. And it's produced by it's sung by Lanny Hall, wife of Her Palpert. Um and Who? Her Palpert of the T and the Tijuana Brass. It did the the trumpet. On yeah. the one thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's one connection somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> there are various connections through this uh uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> if, I, if I only had an actor who was in the series previously. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> God, <laughs> I know. A slight one connection. Well, no, actually, I mean, I'm thinking like Michelle Legrand, who, who um, did the music for this. He also did the music for the 1970s Wuthering Heights with Timothy Dalton. Oh, I don't think I've seen that one. I must uh, watch it. Uh, yeah, but he also did, I mean, this score is awful, but he also did the score to the 1968 um, Thomas Crown Affair. And wrote, that is brilliant. And wrote Windmills of Your Mind. Didn't that win Oscars? It won an Oscar, exactly. didn't it? <laughs> and then he came and wrote this. Uh, I don't this know film it... was like the complete nadir. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, so, yeah, there's a training mission, oh, which dear. does not sell itself as a training mission, but it does tell you Connery's back. He's moving well. You can actually see him thinking about what he's doing rather than being Superman. And, you know... You see him doing proper spy... The spy action's not bad. One minute, 47 seconds, the below seven. What did you yeah, think? Yeah, it, it is a bit grittier, isn't it? I mean, that's what they, 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 what's what they initially tried to go for. They go for like a a little bit more grittier type, type of bond here uh, with the whole breaking into like some abandoned palace somewhere. And, you know, and a girl like stabs stabs him in a, or fake stabs him, if you will. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of all right. And then we cut back to MI6. And it, this is the first sign, some to me, apart from the music, that something's wrong, because we're, put, we're in front of us is a terrific actor giving the, a horrific performance. He's so what, Sean Connery isn't that bad. Come on, <laughs> Edward Fox's M is her, horrendous in this. Oh, do shut up! Oh, come on! Oh, 007, Oh, oh, do come on! That's so fun. And. Uh, 
Yeah, You'll do more than that. And you've got his sidekick there, who I thought was meant to be Bill Tanner. And when I looked him up in the, the credits, he's a guy called Elliot who does fuck all in the whole film. <laughs> I don't know who he is. He's really... This is just awful. Uh, he's been in a few like, British sitcoms and that as well, isn't he? Kind of like a British character well, actor. Yeah, yeah, British yeah. character actor. I've seen him in several things. But um, this is this is bad. And, and Connery manages to play what, pretty well off this. And he's got... He, he does have a, an older man's sort of sanguine approach to it all. That he's effectively semi-retired, mm. and uh, and it's because the new M's got no use for the double O section, and Bond's getting a, getting on in years and a little bit of a, out of shape as well. Um, and they talk about his training exercises, which is quite funny because Connery's of the opinion he's been doing really well, but he's been killed once and like had both his legs blown off once. <laughs> Not really, but obviously in the game. I don't know why they would represent that, because he seems to really kill people. <laughs> uh, perhaps he has got bionic legs, I don't know. He's a bionic man. And he's sent off to a health farm. Jublins, hooray. Which makes more sense than in Thunderball. Yeah, I, I, I think the health farm bit in this actually does work better than it does in Thunderball. And, yeah, and I, I, think, I, I think I said this uh, when we originally did Thunderball, but like the the actual whole plotting with the um, Domino's brother uh, just makes more sense. Like, why don't you just blackmail her brother to, to do it rather than getting a guy who... And spend to two get, years to, on that. Yeah. Spent years on plastic to, to get, surgery. Get surgery to make it look like him to then kill the guy when, you know, and then do the job for you, you know, you know only to kill him, you know. Whereas you, you, you've already got her, already got his sister. Just, just use her yeah. to say, look, do it or... <laughs> We'll kill her. And they got him hooked on something. Basically, yeah. they got him hooked. For those who haven't seen the film, and I can't imagine that's many of you listening, uh, the guy who plays her brother, Jack Patachi, also played Brad in Superman Three, and it's more <laughs> it's more or less the same role. Yeah, I knew, I, I knew I remembered him. Somewhere. <laughs> seen him from somewhere. Basically, middle aged with substance abuse issues. Um, Is there, there's a typecasting going on. Here. Yeah, he, he, he looks directly from the seventies. That's he, he looks exactly like that. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, so he's at Troublands, and he's being looked at after by a private nurse, who basically is dressed and behaves like something out of a porn film. It's very dodgy. I'll sing Cruella de Vil. Because you always keep, you know, if you're going to give someone an injection, you keep it in, you keep the syringe in your stockings. <laughs> but I, I, it, 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 this... sorry, go on. Chris, you no, work I'll... in a care home. Do you ever keep syringes in your stockings? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny, like it was the it was the uh, it was a little odd comment, you know. They sort of like, which is like brushes brush past, like some like some of the staff, and there's like a actual line of dialogue by some of the staff, like about like oh, like you know, sure she's not from around here, you know. Obviously, you know, wouldn't that would be behaving like that? Yeah, thanks, like, thanks it, for these, these agency nurses almost like yeah. Like, it's like, my God, times never change. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so Con- Connery's told that to go there to clear up free radical, free radicals. Now, apart from a joke to Money Penny, I don't know why they expended so much dialogue on that. Uh, no, Money Penny looks nineteen. Yeah, she does, and yeah, she's, she's wearing just... kind of a tux, which is weird. Uh, yeah, very odd-fashioned choice there. Probably eighties fashion, but she's <laughs> like, I'm to eliminate all free radicals. But, but to be fair, <laughs> Connery doesn't seem to kind of like hit on her though. It is very much like a, just a friendly kind of like, oh, hey, Money Penny, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. I'll have a little joke. Oh, I'll see you later. Do you know, I do, I do than... wonder if... Money, I haven't read Thunderball. I don't know if Money, Money Penny's in that book. I do wonder if they skip past it because they have to. Hmm. Probably. I haven't read it in ages, but I do know that they keep like the original names instead of like um, Jack Bivar's, you know, Jack Patachi. Hmm. Like, all the original names are kept from the book, obviously, because they have to. But, um, yeah, I must go back and reread it. Yeah, uh, it was Francois Duval, wasn't it? In the, that was in one, the yeah. In the book. Yeah, I, I was getting mixed up during the Thunderball review myself. But they, um, like yeah, I mean, this is this is all handled better. Um, there's a few things. And again, you can see several hands on the script. Because he gets out of his Bentley and he says, somebody, somebody says they don't make him like that anymore or something like that. And he says, still in pretty good condition though. Oh, sorry, still in pretty good shape, sir. So, now, then he cuts straight to a room where the doctor says something to him about his body, and he says, "Still in pretty good shape, though." Yeah, I think and that's. I'm thinking brilliant. this needed a fucking script editor. What are you talking about? <laughs> you said that that's so within funny, the last though. ten seconds. Uh, <laughs> I, wonder if, I wonder if that's a deliberate joke, though, because you know we're talking about sort of Dick Clement and you know for an exit earlier. Idea. It's like having the jokes like fill the speaker, please. You know, from here, sort of dodgy jokes like that, and you think 
was it deliberate or? Yeah, I love the fact that she laughed so heartily at the idea that he might shower her with piss from ten, <laughs> ten feet away. It's a bit like when Domino laughs heartily at being sexually abused later, oh, but it's it's not smart. But yeah, we got um, they get through the whole trouble and stuff a bit more efficiently actually. Yeah, I think it's, it works a lot better. That it doesn't thunderball. I mean, it's, it's not as as protracted. I don't think, but um, yeah. certainly the fight seems more brutal as well. Um, they do seem more brutal, but they finish with a really stupid side gag. Mm, not good. <laughs> what amazes me is how quickly you can stumble into a shelf of of, uh, of glass jars and get killed by impaling yourself on a load of broken glass. Now, like that is it. It just amazes me how it's like oh. He just stumbles in and then he just like falls down. He's got like a mat. He's got he's been st- stabbed, but he's got a whole like whole needle. tube. So it tube just like in his back. Basically, he's got a shelf of glass. Yeah, it's like, like I'm just like, that, well, how did that even happen? It's like I mean, I imagine he might have got a bit cut, but come on, like I, I don't know. I haven't looked at Irvin Kirshner's filmography to know if there's any comedy in it because they fluff this joke. I mean, it's not a funny joke anyway. Basically, he's fighting Pat Roach, who's the who's the guy that. Indy fights by the plane in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Same actor. Yeah, same guy. And, um, you know, he was always brought in as, you know, tough guy. Basically. He's a big heavy, really, isn't he? So, but he's yeah. clearly stronger, younger, fitter in everything else than Connery. So Connery is having a tough time in this fight. And well designed, it, it, so. It, it works well for me, most times. Because there is a bit where hmm. they do kind of like, they, they're fighting through like the corridor and while everyone's watching the boxing match. Yeah, and he stops and puts of... his arm on the chair and watches a little yeah. bit for when the yeah, woman Yeah, he watches a little bit of it. Yeah, and it's all handled really well, but eventually they're in the lab. And Connery's backed into a corner. He's been well beaten up. So he grabs a beaker of whatever's next to him, chucks it in the guy's <laughs> face. And to skip to the end of the joke, it's James Bond's urine sample, right? <laughs> but this bloke struggles screaming with pain at this for what feels like an eternity. It's really it be- dragged out, this joke. And then he's dead. <laughs> It's, it's just like toxic me that kills him. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. well, of course he's dead because he's got like he's been stabbed to death in the back by poison. Random, or something. By, you know, he didn't it's a hazard. that hard into it, but he basically exactly he that's why he's just he's dead. <laughs> like he just stumbles into it, gets stabbed, and oh, he kills over. It's like what? Yeah. So Ridiculous. yeah, not so good. But it always has me in stitches, though. Sorry, excuse the pun, but it's just like it's so <laughs> ridiculous. It's just like, oh, God. Oh, it's so, just a wee joke. But hey, a... hey, before that, he um, before that he meets Pat Fearing, who is called Pat Fearing in this still, as as with you. Uh... He's still trying to seduce her. And yeah, basically he's straight onto that, and she manipulates his back, and basically comes to his room with not very exciting food, and he shags her. Yeah, no, foie no, gras massages this time. Yeah. Foie gras. Foie gras. Just fall mm. off, apparently, so bear that in mind. <laughs> and <laughs> That's the magic, people. That's the and, secret. And, and presumably, after they've had sex, and this film has one of the funniest sex scenes I've ever seen, <laughs> uh, he hears, basically, Jack Patachi having the shit kicked out of him by his private nurse. Fatima Blush. She's got to be, like, a, apart from like Zenya on the top and... Oh, I can't think of who else. Other other Bond girls. Um, yeah, she's got to be like one of the most highly sexed Vanessas there is in the series. Well, she's very cartoony like. She was like, yeah, you mentioned like Cruella Deville with their massive like fur stoles, and it's just like what? It's completely. She's, very yeah, cartoony. she's very highly animate, uh, animated and over the top. Um, I, I can imagine some people not really enjoying. It. I, I I did enjoy it. I, I think it kind of it it, it added like a bit of colour to the film, shall we say? Mm. And, it, and, she, and she's memorable, and I liked how she's just like insane. She's like, like, the pleasure was afforded me by Fatima Blush Borova, and she just, she's utterly mental, and she wears like these sort of leather, plastic leather trousers. And Well, actually, where, she, where, where she's killed later in the film, it occurred to me that from the waist up, she's dressed like Liberace, <laughs> and from the waist down, she's yeah. dressed like General Zod. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Needle before Zod and stand up beside Liberace. <laughs> that's, that's a too many influences for a character there. <laughs> uh, it's it's absolutely all over the shop. I mean, 
we'll get onto it as we go through the scenes, but we'll get to scenes that you go, did anyone like look at this script before they put it out? But she's quite over the top. She's really vampish, quite attractive. And it did occur to me that if you took her and Klaus Maria Brandauer, you could have cast them as Zorin in Mayday. Yeah, pretty much. That's quite what easy. You've got like a great like theater, well, his name is like a theater actor, isn't he, um, Brandauer? Um, I think, although, although I think he's less he's less formidable. He's kind of more of a throwaway villain than like like for example Largo in Thunderball. I think is quite a, a terrifying villain. Um, he's very much he's very physical and he's very much hands on. Um, but Largo here is a little bit like mm, he's more smug and a little bit cuckoo. Mm. Um, I think that kind of works. I mean, for me, it works. It's just like a, it's just like a different take on him but I mean it, it, this one he's just really creepy and kind of like slimy and it's like oh god I can't wait for you to get killed no, but he's it's... also kind of like he, he's like you can tell by his, he's very sort of you can, t- you can tell by his demeanour yeah I won't trust him as far as I can throw him and I mean the only thing that baffles me is why uh, Domino is like at the beginning so madly in love, love with her even though he's like clearly threatens to cut her throat you know it's like yeah it's really weird it's and, and, but, but I, I love that line and I loved how it's delivered, you know, how he's all, like, sort of charming and all smooth and all that. And, like, you know, one little thing, he's like, then I cut your throat. Like, it's like really, cool really thing. sinister. So I really like that. I really like that fat idea that he's just... Yeah, I just found that a bit boring, how, he, how he's yeah. all over her and then how, sorry, how she's all over him. And he's like, ah, oh, I cut your throat. And it's just like, oh, my God. But, yeah, I, I yeah. Think it's, cre- it's creepy how, you know, he's kind of watching her from uh, like, one-sided mirror and you think, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like that. You wouldn't want to flash a black light round that room, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I bet it's drenched in jism. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, with that porno music it listens to, well, like... <laughs> it's <his> porno music. <laughs> <laughs> It's a sexy sax all over again. Ball. I would have loved it if when Connery like sat in that chair later and got off it, the chair had gone with him. <laughs> <laughs> He, he just like put his hand down somewhere and goes like, ugh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> get the yeah. out for um, and yeah, when he's outside <laughs> later, so <laughs> it's Donald Domino. I'm, I'm, look- so got a I'm going to kiss you because I'm looking to provoke a reaction. That that it was a different reaction he was looking. For. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, dear. Anyway, back to Shrublands where they're all wholesome, <laughs> and getting well, wholesome and healthy. Yeah, Jack Patati's there recovering from an eye operation. Where somehow they put the cornea of the president into his eye. That's a security issue right there, isn't it? It is really. I don't know how they did that. that. I don't know. They they must have gone off some sketches and artist impressions. <laughs> and, uh, basically, he's going to replace. Uh, well, he's basically going to make a sort of dummy warhead live, so it can be. Um, yeah. So basically, that Spectre can get hold of nuclear weapons in. A similar sense to the way they did in Thunderball. Well, yeah, they do like a um, yeah storyline is kind of vaguely similar, but they did like a test run, don't they? And then they kind of um, he uses the fake eye to kind of you know launch the real one, so he kind of switches the dummy warheads for the real live things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's just very eighties. I mean, surely back in nineteen eighty three, obviously it was it was very current, and the video game sequence, which we'll we'll talk about later on, was just so horribly dated for me. I just think oh. I think it's more the fact that is there not a failsafe in the system anywhere that says, well, that's the president's uh, okay, but he's not actually here? Well, they have eight seconds. It's it's kind of the eight-second window, isn't it? That's just weird. And also, while it's counting down, it gets to about four, and he's like, come on, come on! (laughs) Quick, quick! It's it's quite predictable. You've got to wait another four. Yeah. (laughs) You've got countdown, so it's like, oh, okay. So anyway, in his fight with Pat Roach, they pretty much destroy the place. Yeah. Uh, we go back for another M scene that fucking makes my teeth itch. I, I mean, but I, I do love Connery's action. He's, he's getting his like, uh, he's getting told off, and he's like, "Well, too fair." And Mandy tried to kill me. Yeah, <laughs> like, he was like, you know, uh, you know, I'm not like I when I went asking for it, you know. But uh, I like that kind of. I, I think I, I do like Connery in here though, because he's just like he, he's calm. He's confident, it's but he's not calm. like yeah. Yeah, he's very he's not, he's not over egging it. There's he's no like, seething he, in this one. No, no. He's, he's, he's taking the bollock in, but he's kind of like knows that. Well, you know, fucking idiot. So I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, so exactly. He, like, he I'm not going to waste my breath. I'll, I'll make my point while he was trying to kill me. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Make sure his point's well known. Yeah. So Connery is told about uh, 
yeah, basically he immediately. What's he, where's he t- sent to next? Is this when oh, he's sent yeah, to the Bahamas? Yeah, Bahamas. No, well, yeah, he goes to uh, Q, doesn't it? Well, Q Lab. I'm not sure if it's actually Q. Algae. Uh, yeah. Algae. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but no, yeah, you get, the, you get the Q scene, don't you? Um, but we haven't talked about the Blofeld scene yet. <sighs> well, so really much to say, really, other than it's just like I've... Max von Schneidel. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to mispronounce his name each time. Um... <laughs> Uh, it, 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 in a chair, stroking a cat, talking to some people. Um, Isn't it a shit. supreme irony that you've just fought for the rights to Blofeld? You get him, you put a celebrated character actor in the role and give him about 15 seconds? Yeah, you waste him so much. It's just, oh. I, I guess they were thinking, right, we're going to use him more, mm. and then and then kind of like build him up as the, as the sequels go. I guess. Well, yeah, although yeah. they've got him strike, stroking the white cat, which is an Eon invention. Ooh. Which is interesting. But they got away with that, but then I suppose he was on screen so briefly. And here, I mean, again, I don't know how it is in the book. Instead of being number one, he's Supreme Commander, is it, of Spectre? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Largo is, and Largo is, yeah, Largo's Largo's number one. one. Yeah. Which is very interesting, I thought. So he's chairman and Largo's chief executive. Or something. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing as number one. It is the same two. thing, but I think yeah. well, I do wonder if that conventions the book. Yeah, but uh, I have to go back and read it after this. I think it's quite clear Klaus Maria Brandauer is the lead villain in this film. Lead villain. The lead villain <laughs> again. <laughs> Becca knows he's the villain, but she's thinking of his Willy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my ginger tea on today, so I'm kind of so, there's no alcohol oh, involved. Uh, really? Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So, uh, sorry. So, what can you say? So, it's good to see. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so, cool. so we're in uh, we're in Q Lab and Q's like. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of like this Q scene because Q gets to moan about real things like it's fucking freezing. We're always getting a budget cut. I wish I was you know, in America. I might, yeah, I might as well work for the CIA. Get like all, <laughs> get all these nice things. Air you know, And he's moaning about the these. And then about these moaning like. He's got a cold as well. I just like that little touch, you know, and, you know, it's it's the little sort of things I like. You tell they're the good friends. There's, there's a lot of kind little... of snide comments um, made towards, I guess, I don't know, towards, like, the government at the time with the budget cuts and everything, because, like, M complained that he's having to kind of refinance the the build, you know, the reconstruction of, of Shoplands from his meagre budget. And then Algie's complaining about budget cuts and one thing or another, and obviously how he'd rather be abroad. But I just think that's, that's, that's a kind I of... Think, I, think a second, I think gender reassignment's taken it a bit far. I mean, well, if, well, no, if, sorry, if he wants to go and work in a foreign country, that's fine. But becoming abroad is totally... Beautiful. Sorry. <laughs> but those sort of things happen all the time anyway. So I'm, I'm kind of... I kind of like... It adds like a bit of like a character and humane sort of touch to him. It's a bit like, oh, all right, please. I, I, quite, I don't mind this cue at all. Yeah. Um, I don't mind this scene at all. Um, no, I think it's quite a good cue scene. It's one of my favourites, I think. Um, the big gadget is a pen, again, with the Union Jack on it. Because <laughs> spies do pens. not give away who they work for. No, they didn't give out endorsements. <laughs> mm. And one of the things during the making of this film uh, that, that they said was, uh, as they were about to go to the Bahamas, they were a day or two away. And what, one, so I can't remember who said it to who. I think it might have been one of the writers to Schwartzman. He said, have you worked out yet why we're going to the Bahamas? And he said, well, and it's like, well, you better find out soon because we go in two days. Oh, and when you actually look at the Bahamas scene, it's kind of a bit pointless. Yeah, it's a bit kind of thrown in there, literally, isn't it? Oh, let's, just, let's have some glamour. Film starts to have a few problems now because we're introduced to Nigel Small Fawcett. Bloody hell. Which I don't know <laughs> if that's meant to be a tiny penis joke. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's played by Rowan Atkinson, and it's Mr. really, Bean. really yeah. fucking awful. It's meant to I, be I, funny. I, I don't, this, is, I, this is a Clement and Lafreny uh, thing as well. I, yeah, I don't imagined. particularly mind this, and I, I understand it's annoying, but I just I, it's just like his reaction of like, Mr. Bond, Mr. Bond, and it's like, oh, like, oh, I'm meant to be secret undercover. Is that why he shouted my name across the thing? That's a good line. Damn. I'm new to all this. Mm. Damn! You know, it's like... Damn it. you know, and you know, everybody and, and wants to fuck James Bond instantly. He talks for about two seconds to a woman on a boat, and she's immediately onto him. <laughs> And then he goes, oh, the Barbara, the Barbara Carrera sex scene. Oh now, when they were at Shrublands... Those dungarees, oh my God. Yes, when they were at Shrublands, 
Uh, Jack Patachi sees someone at the window because Bond's spying and something goes wrong with the blind and he ends up getting spotted. Yeah. And he goes and hides in the shadow, but she's got some night vision gadget and she goes, oh, 007, because he's back to being a bit of a celebrity. Yeah, uh, we use it wherever we uh, go. She works for Spectre, so it's quite possible, to be fair. Yeah. Um, so she goes to the Bahamas and just sort of happens by him. It's, mm-hmm. you know, no, I mean, delib- accidentally on purpose sort of thing. Yeah. And they decide to go down to see basically where they think the um, missile is. I do like that line, by the way. Oh, no, uh, I'm wet, my, 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 my martini's still dry. I like that line. He delivers it quite well. Just yeah. playing the whole film. Yeah, he delivers it, it de- delivers it a better... He's, he's got a more easy rapport with the women here than perhaps he did during his initial run. I kind of quite like him here. Yeah, but they go like onto the ship ready to sort of dive down. And they have a sex scene that I'm sure the makers of Team America watched. <laughs> before they filmed theirs. It is a bit like that. It's like, oh. It, it's cutaways to sort of slow motion fish. And then it cuts back to ever more sort of her leaning back and, oh, it's fucking awful. <laughs> Worst sex scene in a Bond film ever. <laughs> Chris, your thoughts? On the sex scene? Yes. Uh, I'm struggling to even remember it. It's that memorable. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe because I just switch off. Yeah, it's kind of non-existent, really, isn't it? It's pretty. It, it's, away. it's pretty. It pretty much goes into like, oh, we're gonna sort of do some, you know, swimming underwater. Oh, this bit's kind of slow, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Which we'll get to, like, why the ending's a bit crap because you know, again, it's like Bond underwater, everything's slow, oh, wow. and you can't really oh. tell what's going on. So you can't really see who's who, and it just comes a bit, yeah, boring. Um, but it's yeah, I, 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 I kind of. <laughs> switch off to, until things start to get a bit fun again for this. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not... And again, she puts some kind of receiver on his tank that attracts sharks. <laughs> yeah, random sharks. And again, it's... It, it, he must have got it from Batman. So it, like, it's you know, not but... terrible, but it is... It is, we've got to film something today. It, it just feels like... I cannot imagine this was in a well thought out script. I think this is just. Does a bong actually it, kill a shark? It's, it's busy work. It does. Well, he, gets, he throws a net on it effectively, doesn't he? But it's it's not a very good scene. And then he comes back up onto the water and he is basically hooked by that woman he was talking to earlier who joked she wanted to catch someone something six foot two at 190 pounds. Oh, and lo and behold, she does. So having basically flirted with her, gone and shagged. Fatima, gone for a quick dive, and I mean in the water. Um, <laughs> and then he comes back out, goes straight, and basically has her straight away. Is that Nicole, though? Uh, no, it's not the agent. That, that oh, okay. You see the agent after they leave the Bahamas and go to Nice. Uh, but yeah, so she basically they go back to the hotel. Fatima spots he's still alive in dungarees. <laughs> um, Awful. Yeah, oh, no. 80s fashion. I mean, well, it's not fashion. Talking. It's he's wearing whatever he can because he's, <laughs> he's got. He can't, man. he can't walk around in a wetsuit, so it's whatever's on her boat. It's like the, it's the least. I know, but it's like choose something else. It's like when, when you. I don't know. I guess it's just a sight gag. Like, oh, look at Bond. He looks like an idiot. <sighs> okay. It's like when you think so she Bond, then goes to Fatima, having spotted he's alive, goes and puts a bomb in his bedroom. But he's now having sex with the other woman somewhere else. Valerie Leon. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like there was no need for any of this. Good job. I thought of you going to your place. <laughs> yeah, great. It's like, yeah. And when she right, a, a bomb goes off in a in a, a suite across the other side of the pool, and she says, "What's that? Proof we made the right decision." Surely everyone would be evacuated, not continuing to shack. <laughs> no. You wouldn't just go. Oh look, a bomb. Oh, anyway, just gone off. Uh, anyway. Well, she's we? midway. She's midway through sex, so sometimes, it sometimes it's like, um, well, I should be getting out, but I'm just about to come. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do that first, and we'll. <laughs> yeah. So they then head to Nice, which for a moment I thought was one of the laziest effects I'd ever seen, because we <laughs> cut to a boat, right? And there's some water, and the water's not moving, and I'm like, that's really fucking lazy. Then the camera pans back, and it's actually a still picture with a Nice airport. <laughs> so I'm like, that's all right then. 
It could actually be a still in the film, you never know. <laughs> and he's met by Felix Leiter and insert name of French agent. <laughs> what, Nicole? Yeah, no, Nicole, but she's never... Papa? She's a pointless character. No, she, she's basically the, the female agent in uh, in Thunderball who, get, who gets killed, so it's basically her counterpart. Oh, Paula. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. But it was just... Uh, yeah, it, it, it's all got... It's all got this sort of, pardon the pun, domino effect from Barbara Carrera signed on when the script didn't give her much to do. She complained bitterly. Irving Kirshner promised rewrites coming. And it's almost like she's killed by, she's there to be killed by Fatima, which is almost an output of they need to give Barbara Carrera something more to do because there's no real need to do any of that. And it's just, I don't know, it's just the film's still doing okay. Um, and we do get to, we do get introduced to, well, properly introduced, reintroduced. We've met, have we seen her before? We've seen Domino once, haven't we? We've had the, yeah, when, um, Lager we've had the black light scene. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> big wipes. Right. Yeah, so. We have the ballet, dan- uh, ballet dancing disco. Yeah, <laughs> so Sean Connery now takes part in a massage scene. Where for Again, once, that, that Bond... place doesn't have very good security because he just he slips in there as, as a masseuse and they think, oh, he doesn't work here. I was like, what? He just goes in and says, do you, do you, do you service men or whatever it was? He yeah, said. Like, do you serve men here too? And he's like, yeah, yeah some more than others. Mm. Yeah, because she's immediately it's it's taken its cue from Eon at this point. Basically, this woman behind the counter has looked very briefly at a middle aged man and decides that she would fuck him given the chance. <laughs> and it would be appropriate dialogue for her to hint strongly at that. Right? <laughs> and so he walks through, and he starts mas- massaging Domino, because he knows she's attached to Lager. Okay, yeah. And what I love about I, I've got a bit of a mi- mixed feelings about this scene, because at the end of it, having given her this massage, he walks off, she finds out that he wasn't working there, and she flashes this coy smile, and I'm like, well, that, that's very sweet, but you have just been sexually insulted. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, you, you, you would be more disturbed by what's just happened. Yeah, you, like, just, oh, particularly as when she said lower, he was like, he, he was not only reaching for her bum, and to Connery's credit as an actor, he looks genuinely a bit out of his depth at that point. He's a bit like, fucking hell, really? Like, what do I do now? Oh, oh, my God. But as he's leaning forward, her hands are coming off the sort of front of the table by... His crotch is pressing up against their hand, <laughs> and it's just goes on a bit long as well. He, he lifts the towel up, doesn't he? And he gets a right eyeful. He just he cops an eyeful. He's just no shame in it. He's like, all right, let's have a look. It's like, what the hell? He does, but he, he, he pulls <laughs> an immediate. He's, it's very Richard, Richard from bottom. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, she's happily sort of gives a, a member of staff information or, or, or someone she thinks is a member of staff. You know, like, oh, don't tell me about your brother, tell me about your boyfriend. Oh, really? You lost something? Okay, that's interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's quite open with this information. She doesn't care yeah. who she tells. Mm. Happy endings all round. <laughs> 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 so now Bond gets uh, word that there's... She basically tells him there's a... Yeah, a charity do. A charity do that night. Uh, and this is where this scene really shows its age. He turns up to this event. And it's got probably the best joke in the film. I do like the joke with the bomb. What about the martini still dry? I do. I do you not feel sorry for the guy because he's just a guy who works there. It literally just like right, you got to stay there for like two, two or three hours it holding moved. this thing. No lateral which movement. Must, no lateral with, movement. Yeah, with much, which has to kill. That, that's quite. Yeah, you know, he, he punches him in the gut first. And tells him, right, pulls a gun on him and tells him, right, right hold this or, it's, or you're going to die, basically. He's there, terrified, yeah. for like two hours. I was thinking, what this guy done? He's not like a henchman right. or anything. It's He's... a cigar case. And again, it's yeah. like we got, we ought to put a joke here. It, it's This film it's is quite like... self-consciously sort of trying to stitch itself together. Yeah, I thought we need some, a funny moment here, so let's just shove one in, you know. That isn't the, thing, even funny. the things I thought of in this scene, though, was sort of observations is Kim Basinger's character looks very like she's dressed and styled very like Liesel in this scene. Yeah. Um, also, they seem to have, it's a black tie event in the smokiest room in the world. <laughs> and smoking with also, they've got arcade games there. It was the 80s. 
It's it is really, really crazy. They, that place looked awesome when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah so and cool. We're not just talking about domination. We're talking about the game domination. <laughs> we're talking about... <laughs> They are like okay, they are like um, in this posh casino. There are like arcade rooms. That's really random. It's just it's so well, not an. So you can play but... Frogger, <laughs> and uh, he apologizes to her and says, "I owe you an explanation. Can I buy you a drink?" He says the Bond James Bond line says it quite nicely, and basically does kind of explain who he is. He doesn't order a vodka martini shake and not stir, though, does he? He says vodka and rocks. So. Yeah, he doesn't even... Uh, uh, yeah, doesn't even... Probably rights, though. Sorry? It's probably rights, though. It it might, have the right. I don't know. I would imagine that. That could be any old thing. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, it's an okay it, scene. It, it, it might have been a choice where we're like, we can't push it too much, so let's just do just enough what we need rather than... Mm. Do yeah, rather than egg over-egg it too much. Hmm. Yeah, and um, we do get we we get introduced to Brandauer again, who knows who he is. They know each other, you know. They know who they are, and they go off to play Domination, which I originally, when I was trying to remember this film, called Stratagema. Then I realised that's an episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> very similar context, though. Uh, very similar idea. Um, and it's quite sneaky as well. The way he kind of he introduces, he's like, "Oh, by the way, there was electric shock. You know, I, I forgot to tell you about that, but." Mm. And it's just like, you bastard, you know? <laughs> shall, shall we begin? <laughs> yeah, very, like, very quick. The way he kind of, like, when he, when he, lo- when he loses, eventually he loses, he kind of just, like, sort of blows his lip, first tips of his fingers, like, like. Yeah. just has a nice little. It's, it's very cool about it. It's just like. Oh. Yeah. But, but, he, but, but, but he, he, does re- he does really good, really good at, he can tell he's really pissed off yeah but yeah he but yeah he's still calm and kind of you know it, it's very subtle and it's it you know you know, you know that, yeah definitely like you know are you uh as gracious as a, a winner as a winner as you are a loser <laughs> mm. well i have lost so uh, yeah and that's it yeah very kind of you can tell he's annoyed <laughs> yeah yeah uh and he's invited to the uh flying saucer the next day isn't he Yes. Yeah. Flying yeah. Source being the name of this overland in this film, so his boat. Like who turns up in kind of like Terry Towling? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, got a bit of a gold finger homage. I was going to say, it's like uh, famous career that he's worn. Mm. Suspect bathrobe, which looks very dodgy. Um, but I kind of going on from the um, from the domination scene, like the no the tango scene. <laughs> I think it's one of the most like dodgy. Well. Not dodgy, but kind of throwaway lines in the film, like where they're dancing the tango, and he's like, "Your brother's dead. Keep dancing." It's just like, "What?" Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Um, no, I don't mind it. It's like because it's just one chance to talk to her, kind of like without people initially like eavesdropping, you know. So I don't mind it. I think it's quite good. But um, yeah, because they yeah. have to kind of hide in plain sight. She's being quite mm-hmm. closely watched. Yeah, so anything he... he tells her is kind of in front of people, so you may as well do it when it's blaring music and your heads and mouths and the ears are sort of moving close together and apart. And Exactly, but it yeah. just seems to be that particular scene. It seems to be kind of a, yeah. a little consequence, really. It came very close to... The, the thing is, it, I mean, Sean Connery took dance lessons for it, and apparently he's not a natural dancer by any means. If Bond dances... If this draws a laugh, it kills the film. I, I I won't even know that to be honest. I mean, I I, I can't dance. So I'm gonna I'm not gonna comment on. on the dance well, no, I'm not. I'm not talking about breaking it. I'm just talking about as a layman as you watch it. If that yeah. makes you laugh, it's gonna damage the film. It's just that, that uh, and it's line, it gets away with it. It's okay. No, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's just that particular line I always find um, slightly jarring because it's just of no consequence, and you think, mm. mm-hmm. but, never mind. Where do they go from here? What's next? Uh, anyway, yeah, get quite, 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 quite close to Fatima's end because. After he beats him at the game and the dancing and all the rest of it, he does give... He basically gives Fatima another chance to kill Bond, really. Yeah. Yeah. There's an epic motorbike chase, which is pretty impressive, I think. It We've got the random jazz score. The score <laughs> is <laughs> so great. ridiculous to this. That kind of. That's the one. <laughs> That's how it goes. <laughs> it really does sound like that. 
<laughs> but then we know Chris has got the voice of an angel. He can mimic anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it's a really good motorcycle chase, but you do wonder why she's gone there and done that. It just seems to need to drag him in. Well, I suppose it's to drag him into the chase. And suddenly, you know, he's bond to the thing of the day. You know, it's Street Hawk. It is a bit Street Hawk, so, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think Street Hawk was a bit later than this, actually. But it's not a bad chase. It's not a bad sequence. No, this is yeah. quite a good chase sequence. And this is one of them, I think. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember this being like kind of like fun, and it can, but I think the most memorable thing it does does end on a good note with uh, Fatima uh, tra- uh, uh, trapping him in the odd cave thing. I don't know. I forgot what it was. Yeah, yeah I know. They, they, another bit that doesn't make sense. They just, they, they're trying to give her, like, I mean, the funny thing, we skipped over it at the time. She killed Jack Patachi by sort of throwing a snake at him. Yeah, and well, just think, yeah. You just think, like. And, th- and then puts a bomb at the crash car. Yeah, and then, you just like, think, right, then... you follow him, you know where he is, put a bomb under his car before he gets in it. Yeah, well, why bother with the snake? Don't throw your fucking snake at him. It wasn't, that, wasn't that in Thunderball as well? Oh, it's like, just that... weird. Another film that's very, very strange, kind of very twisted, a little bit kinky. The way it's done in this film is not clever, though. It's just kind of strung together. And you think, yeah, what? and it does strike of, like, making things up as you go along. Uh, this film, I mean, they, they, they would have... J- Jack Swartzman had no experience as a producer so you'd have things not turning up for the day this bike was supposed to be tricked out a certain way it wasn't and he didn't have the right contacts in the business he didn't have the right contracts in place things were late everything was running over and sean connery claims and he's not notably a liar that he effectively ended up producing this um because he was the only one who sort of knew what he was doing um so all the way through, the director's not getting what he wants. So scenes that work kind of work in spite of themselves. And, I mean, it's like they get to this cave. She demands he writes down that she's the best sex he's ever had. Again, which is bizarre, because where's she going to present that scrap of paper? Yeah. <laughs> it, well, I think it's probably for her own ego, but I like the idea of, like, when they're talking about um, Bond's talk about his memoirs, like, he's just going to start, you know, I'm going to retire and sell my... <laughs> because yeah. I'm famous, I'm going to talk about being a spy yes, and, and, you've and talk about things that are clearly sex. classified. Well, number one was... <laughs> number one was Fatima Blush. Yes, it was a bit like Team America, minus the golden <laughs> shower. And but I, I, love, I, love his, I love his story, like, well, there was this one girl in Philadelphia. Yeah, <laughs> Who was like, that? Who was that? But, right, she had the gun pointed at him, she could fire at any time. And after all of this, Felix wanders out and he's like, yeah, yeah, I've been watching all the time. He's like, why don't you come in and help then? It's like, you, fuck, you are making this up as you go along. Yeah. And then they, so I, I, and then I, they I, strip I off and it. find a push bike. <laughs> randomly. What? <laughs> now, oh, by the way, what do you think of this, Felix, this, by the way? You've heard me say they strip off and find a push bike. <laughs> I'm not suggesting nude cycling here, but they pretend to be like athletes in training. So they're like vest and short sort of thing. Yeah, Felix is the boxer and Sean's the trainer going, uh, duh, uh, duh. Uh, what, what, uh, what do we think of uh, Felix Leiter in this? A bit of a non-entity. Really? It's Felix Leiter? No, no, it's Felix. <laughs> still he's still better than John Terry. But no, this is... this is. No, they try. I mean, the reason he was cast... Uh, they cast a black man was to try to get him to stand out. And it was Sean Connery's choice because he said... This character is just not resonating in any no. films he appears in, so he's not bad, but he's he's pointless again. Uh, you know, and the, one of the big scenes he turns up in is, oh yeah, was studio watching while you nearly got your nut shot off. <laughs> it's like, well, thanks then, Felix. Central yeah, to the f- central to the big plan as ever. Thanks for nothing. Yeah, and the, Barbara Carrera's character dies at about just shy of an hour and a half. And yeah. as with Fiona in the first film, the film kind of dies with her. Yeah, the, yeah, she's kind of like the main... I mean, that's what I think, like, Fiona Volpe is such a memorable character because she is so OTT. Mm. Um, and she's like, you know, she's, she's committed to a villainy as well. She's like, oh, you know, woman makes love to Bond and she expects to hear heavenly choirs singing, or well, not this one. Um, and, Barbara, you know, Barbara Carrera is exactly the same. And she's like, well, this is it. This is my mission. I'm out, out to be as ravishing as I can, blah, blah, blah. And I just think, oh... That's why she's so memorable. That's my mission. I'm failing at it really badly. <laughs> the thing is, she has this weird kind of like, oh, I want to kill Bond 
I've got a hard on to kill Bond, but at the same yeah. time, I kind of want to fuck him again in this yeah. weird, weird, weird kind of twisted, deluded kind of way. All the time. Yeah. Providing he writes down on the best, <laughs> I'm the <laughs> best bestest in stuff. I think that's just her being fucking mental. Yeah, she does like... come off as pretty psychotic, but She's and and it works for the most part. But because a lot of the script isn't worked out, they've kind of they use her slight madness to cover the fact that some of what she does doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, and that's actually just shit writing. But she yeah. is a really strong character in the film. She had a blast making it. Apparently, she got on really well with Connery. Loved working for Kirshner. And her Did she get a, a nomination for this as well? She got a Golden Globe nomination for this. Oh, good. Um, and it's one of those performances I don't quite know what to make of. I think it borders on too much. But I kind of... I do miss her when she's gone. And the film doesn't know what to do after that. I mean, they've stolen two missiles. They found out one of them is under the White House. Or at least in Washington somewhere. I think it's under the White House. And the other one is in the Middle East somewhere. And basically, Bond has a shower. And just after that, he's, he gets like word from M or something that they've sorted the first one out. Yeah. And you think, well, that's not very fucking cinematic, is it? No. <laughs> Explain the plot through dialogue. It's like, what? Yeah. That would have been a much more interesting film, perhaps, if they'd gone to, you know, gone to Washington and had to, do, had to find that bomb rather than sort off to the Middle East. You think, what? Rushcrew even, so... And the Middle East stuff all looks like levels of Tomb Raider, the original one. It's, yeah. It's not... Yeah, for the film from here on, it's not very good. Where do we actually go immediately after Fatima dies? Is it Domino and Bond, like, showering? It's on the um, onto the boat, isn't it, again? Yeah, it's... Um, they, they, they go onto... Well, Bond tries to um, sneak on the boat, but he gets caught, and he gets, like, um, entertained, as you will. Yeah. And then that, that's where he kind of like... Oh, is that where he kisses his domino? Yeah. To yeah. get a reaction. Yeah. And the reaction isn't is... masturbation, as I'm sure he was hoping. No. The reaction <laughs> is... Well, I'm going to pick up an axe. Yeah. Yeah. And... and I think he sells this scene. I actually... I could imagine people watching this and thinking that this is over the top. It's ridiculous. I think it's fantastic. I think Brando is really good here. No, he is really good there, isn't he? And well, he course, goes cause... in, he finds his little he finds his little wank cupboard. Oh. Doesn't he? And he gets in there. I'm never going to watch this film in the same way again now. Yeah, just this in Majesty, so it's not. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't ruin much of your childhood stuff. I'll watch this film in the same way again. I'll never look at her roles in the same way again. Yeah, I know. And you won't trust anyone on like a tannoy on a boat. What the fuck? Hell are they no. up to? <laughs> and and particularly if they're by a dance studio. Yeah, looking um, out for that two way mirror. Why has he designed the boat that way? <laughs> just thinks, well, if I get a fit young girl, I can, you know, oh God. I could just, you know. Whew. So what does he go in there for, Connery? He goes in there to find something out. Probably to have a phone call with Owen to go, oh, you know, we found the, found the missile. Right. So he gives, but yeah. I kind of zoned out at this point because I just, literally, I, I agree. Like, as soon as, as soon as they do away with Fatima, it's literally just, it just crumbles away. They haven't really worked it out from here on in as well. And they try no. and do action. The action's not very good either. What did no. you think, Chris? I, I... I do. I, 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 I still, I'm still with it. I'm still enjoying it, but um, the plot isn't kind of. It's just not. It's just not interesting. I think that's the problem with Thunderball. Mm. Like the actual idea of the plot itself, which is, which should be kind of like engaging. Should be like, oh fuck, how the fuck are they going to stop these nuclear warheads or mm. kind of thing? And it you just kind of like just zone out, just go like because they're secondary, they're not actually really central. The like I say, yeah. he finds out on the phone one of them sorted. Yeah. Um. And and I, think I mean, I we... mean, to be honest, the, the the reason why I'm watching this now is uh is is uh, uh is well, how do you pronounce his last name? Uh, Bardo. Or Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. one are you no, talking no. about? Oh, uh, well, it's basically for Largo. Basically, I'm Largo. not watching it. For, yeah, it's like it's that campy kind of. Largo, yeah. Yeah, it, that. That kind of thing. I'm, I'm really watching it for that. Um, and he's, you know, he, and again, he takes uh, Domino. He, he pretty much ditches her straight away. Mm. Uh, he goes like, oh, "Well, I'm just going to sell you off to some sneezy." That's <laughs> least probably he, he ties her. He ties her up, and basically mm. they all kind of like you know put their bids in. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, and, he, and that, that nice little sort of sly touches that it plays the music that she practices to. He's like, I thought you yeah. found this amusing. That's clever. I mean, yeah, he does. He, I do. Just, oh, I, I feel really bad kind of like slating him earlier he's put in quite a scary performance but I'm forever comparing him to 
Logo and Thunderball. Oh, I, I just, prefer yeah, him to, I prefer him to Thunderball's logo. Yeah, that's it, and I got big trouble with that because I, yeah. I've seen him in other, other things, and he's such a great actor. When he, when he comes to he's divisive role. though because mm. I've heard people whose opinion I trust, who think he's an embarrassment in this film. So he is very divisive, but I really yeah, he's like, like him. Like a person, but I, 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 I rate him as an actor. Uh, yeah, I think he's a bit iffy in this role, but yeah, I do. I do think there are some scenes where he is genuinely chilling. And he's very yeah. slimy. And yeah, his treatment of Dominic at the end, he's like, well... I, I, I think probably with his the character. best kind of description of his character, really, is the bit where he tells Domino to... He, he gives her, like, the present, which is, like, this big oh, yeah, green statue. statue that's, like, really, that's, like extremely valuable or present. whatever. And he just kind of, like, just breaks it up. He just sort of, like, pl- playfully... This like, is what I mean, though, it. about threads being dropped, because, uh, I mean, yes, the... What's it called? Tears of Allah. Tears of Allah, and yeah. He gives her early in the film. They don't develop that properly. I know it does have an ongoing thing, but it's not very well figured out. No, they, they use it as a map, don't they? But it's kind of vaguely referenced, and you think, oh, yeah, it's really underdeveloped. It's very under... you know, And it's like, you know, the, uh, the, the next set of writers come on board and they forget that bit. You can kind of tell where each one... It's like, um, like AI. Um, you can tell... You can see the join between Kubrick and Spielberg. Um, it's, it's a wonderful film. I enjoy it. Love it very much. Um, but with this one, you can see where each set of writers come in and come out again. Sort of, yeah. A little sort bit of. Of. It still yeah, hangs places. together all right, but yeah, yeah, that definitely... necklace was built as a as a major thing. And in most film structures, that would have been like some reveal in Act 3. And they kind of gloss it here. Yeah. And Bond gets imprisoned, and they never take his watch off. <laughs> Laser watch. <laughs> Yeah. They didn't explain to him. It's like, I love that scene with him, though, where he goes, well, you were a really good agent, and Connery's like, oh, shucks. Oh, that's... thank you. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. Oh. He's great in this film, Connery. He genuinely is. He's having a great old time, isn't he, Bless mm. him? Yeah, I think he's kind of, like, reminiscing a little bit. It's like, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't really sort of leave on the best of terms. It's nice to kind of come back and kind of, you know. It's almost like a decade later he thought, actually, I miss the old boy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that that kind of line of dialogue, you know, you're a great secret agent. That is a, that is a nod to Connery's career as Bond, you know. Mm. So yeah, it's nice. Well, to... yeah, but to, to go back back to uh, Largo, I think he's like when he drops the statue, and you know, she, Domino tells me you're crazy. He goes like, yeah, maybe oh, a little bit. Mm. Uh, and then just kind of like just brush it off almost. If he's like, yeah, well, yeah, you know, it, it just kind of. It really sells that character, and he's just like, he is just, just completely off the wall and just is not evil. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I I'm with Dave. I really, I really, I prefer this Lago to the Thunderball Lago. Mm-hmm. It would have been interesting yeah. to see him yeah, if, like, had had Christopher Walken not played Zorin and had Brando played Zorin, that would have been cracking. I would imagine. Yeah, like I say, you could, you could certainly have. Him and Barbara Carrera playing those roles. Yeah, the ultimate mental people. <laughs> what, and not have Christopher Walken? Oh, no, I'm not suggesting that's what I'd oh, like, no. but I'm saying they remind me of those two. And yeah. you know, if you were to recast, providing you didn't go for Mayday based on the description of Grace Jones, hmm. she could step in as a Mayday type character quite easily. Oh, definitely. Now, did you notice the worst fucking special effect? ever committed to a big budget film the, the, the jumping off horse yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh dear that, that is bad. terrible isn't it I was just concerned for the horse the whole way I was just like oh my god I'm glad to see it survive well even though it was fucking matted in and clearly not what <laughs> even it was a which bit painting. concerned you <laughs> when did you think yeah that's a horse falling <laughs> I just saw it swimming along afterwards and was like oh god Yes, Did you think the map. horse really fell like 400 feet or whatever it was? No. <laughs> no, it's terrible. That is the very... I think that the the 80s, like CGI, what well, it sounds like CGI, um, the... Oh, well, like the warhead, warhead, I can't remember what it's called now. Um, missile vision. Do you see things from the missile's point of view as they're flying through the air? That's really oh, bad. When the missiles were flying, that reminded me of um, <laughs> the flying cars in like Back to the Future. Yeah, and, and the bit where Biff drops that, um, not Biff, Griff drops the um, uh, hoverboard, the real like powered up one. Yeah, I, that... I say, I say that warhead bit was probably the most dating thing of the film. It's like, oh, okay. What more than the more than the um, casino full of arcade 
games. Yeah. Because that, that has the, cause you can even have that as a kind of like, oh, that's very kitsch. Oh, that's very oh kitsch. I see. Yeah, you could you could even have that now. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah, it's like now it's kind of retro, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. But like, whereas in the 83, it was cutting you know, edge. You know, I, I, I thought of the thing you should never think. I mean, I thought of Superman 3 when I saw Brad, obviously. But I thought, right. of Super, <laughs> I thought about Superman 4 when those warheads flew overhead. Because they flew over those kids, and those kids didn't even fucking look. And you think, that's really lazy. And there's a bit in Superman 4, and we'll cover Superman down the line, but there's a bit where he, he does this action sequence on the Metro, which is definitely the London Underground. And uh, he flies down like a tube tunnel past a load of passengers waiting on the platform, and none of them turn their head to look because he superimposed on afterwards and the director was too shit or lazy to go, turn your heads right now. And, uh, yeah, it reminded me of that. So you can see some of these things were done in a hurry or changed in post-production. It could have been that Superman was just too quick that people didn't notice. Have you seen Superman 4? <laughs> yeah. He's not, he's not racing. No. <laughs> Oh god! I, 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 I've I've got a funny thing to say about Superman Four, but uh, you want to hold it till we get there. Will you remember it when it's like middle of next year? Write it down now. Yeah, I. You know, I, I I've already said it before on, on a podcast, but yeah. All right. I, yeah, it's, Superman's a bit of a twat in that film, but anyway. Yeah, we we are. Uh, it's a short series, Superman. If we only cover up to say returns, we haven't totally decided that yet. But if we were to, I think it's the one f- sort of really short series we do a commentary on. Because you've got to commentate on Superman 4. It's hilarious. It's dreadful, but it's, <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's one of my uh, first memories going to the cinema that I know I definitely watched oh. at the time. All right, yeah, yeah it, it's not good. But, it uh, is terrible. But yeah, this film shouldn't be reminding you of stuff like that. But there you go. And it's not like this film was made on the cheap. This had a, a double the budget as Superman 4, four years before. So it's not terrible, but as we get to this point in the film, I'm not interested. They they jump off they jump off uh, they jump off a building on a horse in one of the worst special effects you'll ever see, and they survive that. And then I don't know diving or some shit, and that's kind of how the film is. They they go they've got to stop this final bomb, so they have a terrible shootout on the set of Tomb Raider. <laughs> and it's a really it's bad different. shootout. And then they go and basically do this really lackluster diving sequence. See, now this shootout is is particularly the scene that I remember watching when I was very young on TV. And this is what I think when I think of what the first Bond film you saw. And I think back to... And it could have been this. And and it, well, yeah. it's not definite, but it's it's like, it's the one memory I have when I was... The, when I f- was very young, watching Bond, and this was and this was this was it. This was definitely. I, I think the bit I remembered of this film was was the um, was the bike and f- the end of Fatima. I think I think that's the bit that always mm. stuck out to me, and that that in the opening sequence. So yeah, it's a bit. Again, it's underwater. Trying to do action sequences over water never underwater never seems to work too well. No, especially when it's your main climax and. It's it's the bit where the, oh you got to fight the main villain and you can't quite tell what it is. Cause I, I think it's important that when you have the like the fight with the villain, you need to kind of like see him regularly to have that kind of like initial impact. You can't be kind of covered by mask underwater. You mm. need to kind of have you need to have that kind of what's the word I'm looking for? You need to make that con- yeah, you need yeah. to make that a bit of a personal connection to like, no, right, well, this happened, you know, and, and it's cut and dry and it's, you get more satisfaction out of it. This isn't satisfying to me. Well, another, um, another story Kirshner told about the chaos of the making of this film was when they were, I think it was in the Bahamas, he sent off like a second unit to capture some underwater photography of a Sean Connery lookalike. So he said, you know, get, get a Sean Connery lookalike, go down there, film some underwater stuff. But that person went and got a photo of him in Thunderball. Oh. So you've got a photo of an 18 years younger man. <laughs> and the person who shot it looked exactly like Sean Connery in 1983. So they had to go and reshoot it with that guy instead. 
And it's just it's just a chaotic production. You know, Kirshner kept getting back footage that wasn't what he asked for and so on. But yeah, the the, the ending is really, really throwaway. And uh, this film is, yeah, the, this film sort of dies when Fatima Blush does. But until that point, apart from the fact you can nitpick every scene, you, I mean, you really can. It's not bad. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I still don't know why Domino is with the <laughs> Felix and all that lot. All of a sudden just turns up and shoots Largo. <laughs> There's no reason for her to be there at yes. all. Yes, you can imagine the CIA briefing that morning. Have we got everything we need? Fit blonde with no training? Check. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, yeah. Well, she's the one that pulls the trigger as well, isn't it? So it's pretty. Much... At least in the original Thunderball, she was actually held captive at the time, so yeah. it, it makes sense that she would be there. And then when she does eventually shoot Largo, it's mm. you know there's reason for it. But here it's just like oh oh oh, all right, okay, there you are. Yeah, yeah just it would have been better reasons. if she'd been killed by a parrot turned informant. Give us a kiss. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and then it cuts immediately. Like we look at Largo, uh, sorry, we look at Domino, and then we cut immediately to a diving into the pool, and they're like house in the Bahamas. So she's now like living with Bond or something, wearing a brilliant swimsuit. I, I do like that tiger face <laughs> swim costume that she wears. Christmas. Actually, 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 no, this dates the film. <laughs> Very AC swim costume. I wish I had it. Mm. <laughs> Rowan Atkinson turns up again. And, oh, Mr. Bond. and quotes something that this M would never fucking say. <laughs> M says the future of the civilised world. Fuck off. He never said that. <laughs> he probably said, get that fat twat back. But there it's you go. It's like, right, okay, you saved the world. I've got to offer you not a knighthood, not retirement, but lunch at my club. And it's like, oh, what? I'd be like, screw you. You know, I quit. Well, that's a principled stance, Becca. And we respect <laughs> I'm not, I'm not Bond, so I'm free to say these things, you know. No, I know. It, it's just, yeah, it's a, I really don't like Rowan Atkinson's character in this. I think the thing that I, I was concerned about before we did this podcast is whether we had enough to say. Now, what we've said will go out, and we're perfectly happy with what we've said. But looking at the time now, it's running a little short. And it's running a little short because a lot of this film's just there. And the last sort of quarter of it's not very good. No, I think we've, we've said as much as we can, mm. but, uh, you know, at... We spoke I, can, about, you know. I guarantee we will say more about a view to a kill. Mm. <laughs> We're doing commentary as well. We are. Oh yeah. Yes. Excellent. I want as much of the dream team as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they're, not, they're, not, they're not in it that much. Dream okay. team. No, that's that's why they're the that dream much. team. They can make a little go a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see a spin-off of Bond and Tibbet. That would have been amazing. Just there, you know, him him playing the Lord and then. Replacement that. files. <laughs> it would have been me. <laughs> hey, sorry, Patrick Newney. Patrick Newney. Yeah. <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, that would, they're just so funny. It's a really good pairing, especially because they're absolutely more stability scooter. Scooter file. Yeah, I th- we're going to have a lot more to say about this film. The fact is, this isn't a Bond film, and the thing I think we've—I mean, we've obviously explained all the way through that this isn't an Eon Productions film. It misses it. It misses those little Eon touches. It misses the gun barrel. It misses... I mean, go watch the trailer for this film. It's it's 80s trailer, you'll never see. It's just ridiculous. It's a product of its era, so I'm not going to knock it too hard, but Bond trailers of the era looked a bit more classic than this. Um, So it's got a terrible score. It doesn't have a gun barrel. That's not the end of the world, but it doesn't have a decent song or, or a title sequence or... And it really misses those little bits from the score all the way through. They tried to get uh, the uh, John Barry to actually do the score for this as well, didn't they? But he he, he rejected it. Well, he declined because he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I have ties with Eon, so I'm going to respect, yeah. respect the, the series yeah, that way. Yeah, really sidestep that one. Mm. Mm. I would have been interested to see what James Horner might have come out with because I really like his Ralph Khan score, which is only the year before. Um, yeah, I like um, James Horner as, as a composer as well. Which, yeah, which um, but there's only so much you can do. It's like I said at the outset, this film is a miracle given what they went through. When they wrote things in the script, it had to go via Sean Connery, who had script approval, the producer, um, Jack Swartzman. It had to go via Irving Kirshner as the director, 
And then it had to go to a team of lawyers to check it was sort of compliant with the ruling. And so every there was never any speed to anything they were doing. Everything was being bogged down in legalese and, and everything they're writing, they're second guessing whether it's all right. And, and then it goes through several checks and that the answer to that might be this, we can't use this. And so to get an even remotely cohesive film out of this is a bit of a miracle. It's saved really by an excellent Sean Connery performance and you really realise how much you missed him. I didn't like him in his 40s in this role. He was he'd lost interest and he was playing it like a right misanthrope. But Connery in his 50s is actually really good and I would take him over Roger Moore and I would take this over Octopussy. I think what helps as well, I think I've said it before, is that the play's age in here as well. They acknowledge the fact that he's old and out, and out of shape. And he's just kind of like a bit of a relic. So, you know, they, they do, like, yes, he does still look old, but they do play with it. Like, they do acknowledge it in the film, which kind of helps. He's semi-retired, and yeah. yes, he does knock people out, and does, and yes, he does have a ridiculous level of attraction to women. But he doesn't do anything really outlandish in terms of physicality in this role. And, um, yeah, I, I think I think it's a good performance. Sean Connery hated making the film, and he hated making this film because he and Jack Schwartzman didn't get on, because Sean Connery is not someone you want to work with if he thinks you don't know what you're doing. But the difference is, because he's he's so involved and invested in making this film a success... He's more dialed into his performance than he was, and he and he felt like uh, than he was in Diamonds, and he felt like he owed, you know, to get the film out. You know, he had to be professional, so he had a bad time. But it doesn't show in his performance. No, but he didn't make a film after this. Time. He didn't make a film after this till like in the name of the rose, I think, which is three years later. Uh, he had a terrible time, um, but it doesn't show. But again, like a lot of these films, a little bit tonally all over the place. I don't really know what Rowan Atkinson is doing in this film. I don't know what a such a, relief. I don't know. Yeah, well, I know what I know what he's there for, but it doesn't really work. And you've got a really, really terrible end in this, uh, which is incredible from Edward Fox. He's a really decent actor, but on balance, I you know I sat here and I, admittedly I wasn't in the best of moods for various reasons, but I sat here and absolutely destroyed Octopussy, and I I thought I would do this. I thought this would be down there with like diamonds. Well, it's not going to be that high up. It lost, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The ending's rubbish. It doesn't have the eon touches. But I actually kind of found a way to quite enjoy, it. and it didn't feel. It didn't feel a chore to watch it again. It wasn't. Oh my god! I've got to watch this again. It's all right. Yeah, I'd kind of rate it the same. I mean, it's not. It's not um, the best of a movie, but by no means is it the worst. But it's like, yeah, it's okay. It's it's a mess. It's a complete not a mess. Mm. But it's it's a fun mess. So it's it's good entertaining to watch. And Connery's having a good time. Um, Edward Fox is wildly miscast. Um, Alec McCowan is as Algy. Um, he's a detective in Frenzy, which is, if we do cover Hitchcock movies, hopefully we'll we'll do that at some point. If we cover Hitchcock, we're covering Frenzy because it's in the masterpiece collection. Yeah, definitely, we've got to do yeah. it. So my yeah. favourite Hitchcock's, but anyway, that's by the by. Um, it's a mess, but it's it's an enjoyable mess. But the real question is, which do we rate highest, Octopussy or Never Say Never Again? Never Say Never Again for me by wow. quite a fucking distance. <laughs> well, that's a shocker. I know. <laughs> I know <laughs> you're a well, the thing is, right, I mean, I know it became a bit of a catchphrase last week and we joked about it. They are both too old, but the way they handle Connery's age is better. And Connery convinces me still at 53 that he can kill you. Uh, Roger Moore doesn't convince me of that at that age. It's really strange. He's He lost that fountain of youth kind of overnight, even through Moonraker. I thought, yeah, you look all right. And then he was sort of on the cusp in for your eyes only. And by his last two, it just seems like the most wildly inappropriate casting. And whilst I think if if he was ever to have made a series out of an alternate Bond series, I don't think starting with Sean Connery was the way to go. He is by far the best thing about this film. Whereas Roger Moore fucks Octopussy right in the ass. And that's probably just him and Maud Adams. <laughs> no, he is too old. I mean, we sort of commented... So much about how how old is the thing. I think a view to a kill. He is, 
he's pushing 60 and, and it shows but I think obviously casting somebody like Tanya Roberts doesn't help um, on many levels <laughs> but um, yeah well in the commentary know, we'll really what's Pussy on Epstein ever again what do you reckon I don't know I'm, I'm torn between the two so I still, I you know, I'm, I'm unlike Dave. I I still enjoy Octopussy. Uh, there's there's a level of fun with it for me, uh, uh, and I kind of feel the same about this. You know, it again, it's it it. I, I like that it's just like it's an offshoot Bond film that isn't canon. It just exists. Mm. So I I just like it. I like it. It's just like a slight return for Connery, um, a, a chance for him to end on good terms, and well. But in terms of his performance, anyway, at least uh, I like the villain. I think there's stuff to enjoy there. Um, so yeah, I, I do. I do. Enjoy, I, I do enjoy. Never say never again. I, it's not perfect. It it's nowhere near as good as like top the top half of the of bomb films. But it's it's not my knees like dead last. It's you know it it, it gets by fine for me. I prefer it to Diamonds Off Forever. Well, quite yeah. comf- well, no, it's I... easy to say, but a lot of the things we were complaining about on Diamonds was Everything. He, he now looks too old in the role, role, and now he comes back, what is it, 12 years later. You would think that would be a complaint, but he's far better in this film. I, than I think the problem with Diamonds is that he just clearly didn't give a shit, and no one else seemed to give a shit in Diamonds, and that was the key problem. Mm. And it's I mean, it's like... an ugly film as well. Like if, if if yeah he might have been look yeah exactly and plus also if if Connery had turned up yeah he's still looking too old but kind of game it it would have worked out fine you know it just would have been all right well he looks a bit old I think the difference is as well the bit that we bring with us that I don't think is you can't help but see diamonds as part of his initial run I know there was a break for Majesties. But the fact is, he'd only been playing the role four years earlier. I mean, that's the different diff- distance in time between Quantum and Skyfall. Um, and so it is shocking to see a guy in his original run, still in it, you know, only around the 40 mark, suddenly look so different from Dr. No. Whereas when you turn up in an unofficial bond 12 years later, he's in his 50s, it's the 80s. He hasn't been at his peak in the role since the sixties. You're much, I think, we're much more inclined to like forgive the physical aspects. You can let it slide a little bit more, can't you? I think. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, he's a, he's actually in better shape in a lot of ways. I would agree. In terms of physicality, I think he's probably in better shape mm. than than Rog at this point. <laughs> but the thing is, he's he's aged his interpretation, and it isn't just Chris alluded to it when he talks to M. There's a calmness and a a world weariness but still a bit of a twinkle there and that's not how he played the role in the 60s he no. evolved his take whereas Roger Moore's uh, uh, performances started to devolve even if you like Roger Moore he starts to devolve and broaden out and actually this film reminds me that like Sean Connery is James Bond and not Roger Moore and not Roger Moore. Not and Roger. that's not to. I've not Roger Moore a lot, but there's a couple of Roger Moore's films I really like. And he's yeah. not a problem in a, in a few more that I don't, even though he, he influences the tone. But at this point, it's night and day. There's a couple of years between them, but one of them looks like a ridiculously old man with stupid hair. And the guy who doesn't actually have any hair looks right in the role. With a wig. Yeah. Either, though, for all the talk about the gratuitous sex and violence, he only kills about three people. Yeah, it's not very gratuitous, is it? It's not <laughs> at all. Perhaps in well, the, the sex maybe, but perhaps not the violence. The, the sex scene was funny. That's not the very gratuitous really either. Funny. Well, but he does, he, he does blow up Fatima though. So. <laughs> Would you she say? Does an explosive death. She does. Um, that's quite. That's quite gratuitous, actually. That is quite graphic. I think her death scene. Well, no, it's actually quite comedic because at the end it's just a pair of shoes. Just a pair of my heels. <laughs> Smoking. It's like, shh. Smoking. Oh my God. That's not all together. Okay, let's wrap this up then, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait because next week's a view to a kill. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that will be a few uh, a few little commentaries and a, a music episode and, and maybe a little something else here and there. But then straight on to Dalton, baby. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a com- we've got a view to a kill next week. We've got a commentary the week after. I think that actually gets into the two commentaries get interrupted by Charlie and in our schedule this time. 
No, it just it just depends on availability of us, really. Mm. Uh, but certainly, yeah, we do that, and then we go on to Connery. So everything is all lined up. We've got View to a Kill next week. We've got the uh, Live and Let Die commentary the week after. And then we've got Charlie Brigden back for a music episode, uh, talking about 73 to 85. And then we commentate on A View to a Kill, which should be brilliant. It should be hilarious. I'm really it looking forward to that. It should actually. be absolutely fantastic, that episode. I can't wait. But I can't wait for next week's episode because next week we get to commentate on an old man and his older mate. <laughs> <laughs> and then he fucks a tree. <laughs> because Grace Jones was carved from oak. Oh, dear, dear. Yeah, she's, more, she's more man than woman, isn't she? She's like the Amazon woman. I... I'll say it again next episode, but like, there's the, when I was looking for clips on YouTube, because uh, we'll, we'll, we decide like what clips we should use, mm. like to to open the show of the film. Yeah, I was I was looking for suitable clips, and one of the ones was like the first time the Bond um, introduced himself to uh, to Stacy, and that scene in isolation, Roger Moore looks like a pervy old sex pest. <laughs> and yeah. Max Orin and Mayday look like they're generally just concerned about Stacey. Yeah, Stacey's away from like, her. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now. come on. It's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's... <laughs> you know, that scene. Nice. It's just, it, you know, it, it's the it's the look in Roger's eyes that sells that he's trying to be sort of suave and charming and all this. And it just looks like he's just got a complete erection and just like will shag anything. Like, That's just... my problem with Roger Moore's Bond. The other thing is, when we talk about Mayday, the scene where he stood on the, the looking at Stacey, the scene he's talking about, Mayday sent over to split them up. Yeah. While she's listening to Bond and Stacey talking, Grace Jones is wearing the most vacant fucking expression you've ever seen. There's just no attempt to like act when it's not her line. I, I you know, there is so much about that film that's dreadful. And she has like a dodgy Russian accent as well, faux Russian accent at that point. She's like, oh, good the helicopter. And it's just like, what? Where, where does that come from all of a sudden? Yeah, accents all over the place. It's all over the shop. Um, and, but, but it's quite an historic film because uh, General Gogol stood up in his only scene. <gasps> he actually stands up. Yeah, she stands <laughs> up for an entire scene and doesn't get a blowjob for that whole three <laughs> or four minutes. You didn't see Rubovich under the desk. <laughs> Yeah. I assume that's what she's doing, you know. Yeah, okay. Oh, dear. Well, Dolph Lundgren had to get his Rocky Four role somehow. Yeah, Dolph Lundgren's in that scene. Yeah, it's Dolph Lundgren, he, isn't it? He was it? dating um, Grace Jones at the time. Oh, thank you. It's not a good film. I mean, I, I don't hate it the same way I hate Octopussy, just because I, I, I just... I've got a little bit more nostalgia for it, and there's a bit more... There's a few more things that stick out, but I'm not suggesting for a second it's a better film, because it, it's a seriously old man, and... This film did not do Roger Moore any favours, the one where we've talked about tonight, because Sean Connery comes back and is just fucking better. Simple as that. Did do the money though, or wasn't as popular? As no, it Octopussy. did about one hundred and sixty million. Octopus he did in the hundred and eighties, but it was a solid hit. It was a, a mm. solid hit. It did fine. It actually opened bigger as well. It just didn't have the legs, and it is a mess. I mean, it is a mess. It's it's not a good film and. As I say, is there really any any excuse when you've been building up to this for nearly twenty years, and you're on set desperately writing your script and trying to change things around? No, it sounds very chaotic. You know, Eon can chuck out whether you like them or hate them depends on your personal taste. But Eon are chucking out perfectly serviceable Bond films every couple of years. Yeah, this one's kind of thrown together very happily. Kevin Quarry, for his passion and and life and life goal to get Bond made. It's really the wrong person to get Bond because he never got it right. No, and the thing is as no. well, you see him listed as executive producer. He handed over everything to like Schwartzman. But Kevin McClory did fuck all on this. You know, he was so desperate to run Bond and he actually paid a smaller role on this than he did on Thunderball. And that's a real shame, really, isn't it, for all the personal investment that he, that he put into it. They didn't actually kind of end up, you know, doing what he wanted to do because this was yeah. his baby. And of course, he, he announces sequels after this and all the rest of it, and you know, it, it goes on for ages. It, it, at one point, he announces a TV show. Yeah, Bond. We'll go through all that when we get to Casino Royale because, as I say, this whole court battle leads us to Casino Royale. It has an impact on the Spider-Man franchise and lots of other things. 
Yeah, it's quite far-reaching, isn't it? So I never realised. So. Yeah. The Battle for Bond is the book you want to read by Robert uh, Robert Sellers. Sellers. Yeah, I can recommend that. It's yeah. really, really good. Yeah, it really is very, very good indeed. But next week, we get back Roger with his grooming suit. Roger face. out. Roger and his groomer. Roger and his octogenarian pal. But yeah, anyway, before we get to that, um, where can we find us on social media? Uh, you can find me at Cinematronics, where uh, you can find the link to uh, the website that hosts this glorious podcast, uh, which is uh, Cinematronics uh, co. uk. I'm at the Pasty Kid nineteen seventy six on Twitter. We also have a YouTube page. If you find us, like you'll find us under Do You Expect Us to Talk? We've had various issues with the. Um, with various videos being muted and all that. We've sorted them all out now, but they are slightly edited versions. Generally speaking, we just edit out the intro music and cut to, like, a little bit after Becca's just said hello. Um, and but To keep YouTube people. basically. Yes, but yeah. with, with the music episode, we did have to cut all of one track in our conversation around it, so we had to sort of stitch two two different sentences Chris said together that were about six minutes apart to cut out the Nina sketch, the Nina sketch, the Nina song, um, because that was copyrighted. All the brilliant songs we played on that episode, and the one that everyone shits their pants about and has to protect is Nina singing about fucking Christmas trees. <laughs> oh. That's anyway, a Nina song. It is an odd thing, isn't it, a copyright? Yeah, yeah we, we, played, we played Louis Armstrong's last song, we played John Barry can be could have could be quite litigious in his in his time and we had to um but we played the Majesty's theme, we played all these alternate songs, we played and we have to cut bloody Nina. We had to cut Lena singing about Christmas trees. And friendship and rainbows and kindness. But no, elsewhere on social media And love. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the one. And love. Yeah. And love. <laughs> Don't mock oh, my northerness. <laughs> I've never mocked your northerness apart from just then. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure you look very good. What's his looks got to do with anything? <laughs> it's northern, as he said. Well, I'm just sitting in my flat cap smoking a pipe. You know? <laughs> Drinking yeah. a pint of mild. Yeah, he'll be having a pint of mild, wearing a string vest, not a hanky on his head. Watch his Gumby. <laughs> very nice. Oh, dear. Elsewhere on social media, come and see us at Facebook slash Expected to Talk. Now on Twitter, we are at Expected to Talk, amazingly enough. Um, you can email us actually. expect us to talk at gmail.com please send us an email send us your thoughts um, feelings emotions if you want to kind of give us some feedback or let us know what you like about the show or anything you or want just to send us a love letter yeah send us a love letter telling me what... that would be lovely Valentine's Day is upon us tell me what a special love to us so, though by the time you listen to this Valentine's Day it probably Day won't be, be yeah, it'll be like... gone, <laughs> been gone. Uh, well hang on a minute when's yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about release schedule after this. I don't want to date it by putting it on the show, but I, I would have thought this will be released not that long after Valentine's Day. No. Okay, Valentine's Day has been and gone, but send us a love letter anyway. Send us a love letter, apologising <laughs> for how you ignored us on Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what a smashing blouse I'm wearing. We want 12 dozen... Make us feel special. We Make want feel loved. two dozen red roses, please. <laughs> yes. Anyway, on that note expected to talk will return with a view to a kill